Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. So welcome everyone to this uh, first breakout session on uh, cryptographic algorithms. We have uh, three presentations, three 40-minute presentations uh, uh, lined up for us. Uh, one on uh, lattice-based cryptography, the second one on uh, stateful hash-based signatures, and then finally uh, a presentation on code-based cryptography. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Atema. I'm a cryptologist at uh, TNO and CWI. Uh, and without further ado, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Leo uh, Duca. Uh, Leo is uh, a senior staff member of the cryptology group at CWI and a professor of cryptology at the Mathematical Institute uh, at Leiden University. He focuses on the theoretical and practical aspects of lattice-based cryptography. Uh, Leo has been involved in the design of several lattice-based cryptographic protocols. Mm -hmm. This includes two schemes, uh, Kyber and the Lithium, uh, that were selected for standardization by the U.S. Uh, National Institute of, of Standards and Technology. Uh, and not surprisingly today, uh, Leo will talk about uh, lattice-based cryptography. So please give it up for uh, Leo. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you had uh, some good coffee. Um, so today I want to give um, a talk a little bit about the, the mathematics that are under, underlying uh, lattice-based cryptography. If you're here, I suspect you already know the standards themselves, Kyber and Delicium and maybe Falcon. Um, and you probably read them, you probably can follow the equations and, 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 and implement them, but what is it that they're hiding is what I want to discuss today. So what, uh, what is it that those computations do in a mathematical sense? Uh, so yes, so lattices are, let's say, the primary and upcoming this standard, Kyber and Dilithium, but there's also Falcon that is coming up. Uh, and ISO is also discussing, though not without any hurdle, uh, the standardization of Kyber and another lattice-based scheme, Frodo. I am, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I am not aware of ISO considering post-quantum signatures yet, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, or at least not lattice-based ones. Where do I have to click? Oh, okay, back, back, back. So uh, I will uh, develop four points in my talk. I will very quickly give you uh, an introduction of what is a lattice mathematically, and then I will try to explain the principles of how you do encryption based on lattices, and then how you do digital signatures on lattices. And then quickly, I, I will discuss the current state of, uh, of cryptanalysis. So what's a lattice? Informally, it's an infinite regular grid of points in, in space. So here we can represent lattices in, in, in two dimensions, but the lattices that we're going to be using for cryptography have many, many more dimensions, and I won't be able to represent them today, or at least not like that. Uh, so it's an infinite mathematical object, but we can represent them finitely uh, on the computer by representing them by a basis. So, for example, if I give you those vector b1 and b2 here, I have, oh, I have a red dot, fantastic. Um, then, from s summing or subtracting many times those vectors, an integer amount of time, I can reach all those black points. So, I can describe the whole lattice just, just giving a few original points. Uh, the thing is that there are many different bases that can give the same lattice. And to some extent, some are good and some are bad. Uh, and what's going to give rise to cryptography is that going from a good basis to a bad basis is pretty easy. You just have to re-randomize in a careful way, but uh, re-randomize your basis. Going the other way around, on the contrary, is a problem that appears to be hard. It is a problem that has been around in computer science for quite a while. Uh, because with lattices you can model uh, a lot of things. You can uh, 
it relates to many other mathematical problems that we're interested in solving. So this is a problem that has been studied for quite a while, trying to go from a bad basis to a good basis. So this gives us some uh, confidence that this problem might be hard and that maybe we can base cryptography upon it. Um, so why are bases so important? Well, in particular, lattices before being used in cryptography were already used for uh, coding theory, but not on discrete channels, but on continuous channels. If you have uh, antennas that communicate, uh, you know, over the air, over radio frequency, you're over a continuous domain, uh, and uh, the noise is continuous. So you, you, if you want to transmit discrete data, you're going to choose points in space, and you're going to hope that they're in far apart enough so that they can tolerate noise, so that you can communicate in a noise-tolerant manner. Um, but the principle that they're far apart does not necessarily suffice to efficiently separate those points. You need a way to tile the space to recover your original message, the point, if you get a noisy version of it, so something in the ball. And that's where the bases come in. With a good basis, you're going to have a tile that is essentially squared or close to square. If you have a bad basis, you're your tiles will be much longer and much thinner. And if it's thin, it means that a little bit of noise can take you out of the cell. So it is m with a bad basis, you have much less resistance to noise if you want to decode. And um, so that's all in dimension two, but in many, many dimension, the problems grow harder and harder. The gap between what you can do with a good basis and with a bad basis grows exponentially in the dimension. So that's how we're going to harness cryptography. We're going to, and public key cryptography in particular, asymmetric cryptography. We're going to use the good basis as our secret key and the bad basis as our public key. We need to everyone to know the lattice, but the one that knows something special about the lattice, a secret key, a short basis, will be able to do some things that the other one cannot do. Okay, so that's the principle. How do you apply this principle uh, for public key encryption in particular? Um, so what you can, you can do a, a little bit like with uh, the coding theory application. The first thing you do is that you view, you encode the message that you want to, to encrypt as a lattice point. You view it as a lattice point. And then instead of relying on the noisy channel to provide the noise, you're just gonna add the noise yourself. That's pretty much it. And then you return uh, this as a ciphertext. So the message plus some error, or at least the message encoded as a lattice point plus some error. And this encoding of the message to a lattice point, you just need to know the lattice. You don't need to know anything special about the lattice. You can do it with a bad basis. On the contrary, if you want to uh, decrypt, well, decryption here is essentially separating the noise from the message. So decrypting is just decoding, and for this you can use the tiling provided by the secret key. Okay? And uh, the key point is that if you try to, to decrypt with the bad basis, well, here I have my message, I've encrypted it to a ciphertext C. Okay, it's, it's, it's not that far from my message, but still, if you have the point of view of a bad basis, it changed tile. So you're going to decrypt to the wrong ciphertext. Okay, so you need the good basis to make sure that you recover precisely the original uh, message. Uh, of course, you need to be much more careful than this because the fact that decryption might fail sometime is not a security guarantee. You want it to fail all the time. So then you need to exploit the big gap between the public key and the, the, the secret key. But at least the intuition is that. Um, so, because all those pictures are in two dimension, I also wanted to invite you to try to get more intuition in larger dimension. And for, for this, I still have some something a bit visual to, to offer you. Uh, it's not uh, here on those slides, but uh, many years ago as a PhD student, uh, with INVI, I developed a, a serious game to try to understand how lattice-based cryptography worked. And basically, it's, it's mimicking some kind of Tetris, but the rules of those columns really match with the mathematics behind lattices. And in particular, you're really going to encrypt the message. Um, well, you, we're swapping the error and the message in this in this one, but those are minor technical detail for, for gameplay. But the principle are here. Again, it's not 
the exact schemes that you want to use, in particular the dimension here would be eight, and that's way too small for security, uh, but there are other details. Again, it's only about uh, getting intuition, and you can play it uh, in French, English, or, or Dutch. Um, okay, so now we've seen a little bit the, the mathematics behind it, and what does that mean in terms of uh, computation, because if you want to implement it, that's also what you're interested in. Well, the, the encryption part, so we, we just wanted to view an arbitrary message as a lattice point. And for this, you're going to take the basis of your lattice, which is a matrix. You know, your basis can view it as a matrix, and your message is a vector. And so to transform it to a lattice point, you're just going to do a matrix vector multiplication. So just some simple linear algebra. Um, for decryption, you have to do this tiling. And the way I represented tiling, it's a bit more involved. Um, but actually, there are ways of simplifying this tiling by changing a little bit the encryption procedure. Again, those are technicalities. The key point is that if you do slightly smarter things, you can also make decryption to essentially be a matrix vector multiplication. And at last, you might be worried lattice is an infinite object, so maybe I need very large integers to represent my points. Uh, this is something we can solve by choosing lattices that are so called QRE. And in that case, you can reduce all the computation modulo Q. And this Q is just going to be a very small integer. 16 bits might be enough. Uh, in some schemes, like Frodo, you can even choose Q to be a power of 2 so that you don't have to do anything to reduce modulo Q. Um, still, you might be a bit worried. How big are those matrices? If those matrices are 1,000 by 1,000, that's, that's a lot of things to represent. That's a million coordinates. Um, so we're talking megabytes of keys. Um, so that's where structured lattices come in. Instead of using arbitrary lattices, we're going to use lattices whose bases have some structure. They're circulant. So in some sense, you don't have to represent the whole matrix. If you just represent the first column or the first row, you can recover the whole rest of the matrix from that. And this is not just something to make the matrix smaller. You can even speed up uh, the computation by abusing the, the structure. Of course, the question is, does that uh, make this uh, scheme less secure? There's been some inroads if the matrix is completely circulant, but for block circulant matrices, there's little we know how to do at the moment. Um, so, what are the performances? Well, it's fast. It's actually very fast. Computation speed is, is not an issue, and we're talking milliseconds on a, on a regular uh, processor. Uh, but, of course, if you compare it to elliptic curve cryptography, the keys are going to be quite big, keys and ciphertext. They're not particularly huge. If you, use, if you look at other encryption schemes, sometimes the public keys are very large and the ciphertext small, or the opposite here, it's, we're in a very balanced setting. Everything is kind of the same size, secret key, public key, ciphertext, and everything is pretty fast. In fact, it is so fast that the slowest thing in the scheme is the pseudo-randomness generation. And this is because uh, we wanted to be up to date with the best uh, way of uh, using hash function, in particular shake. Uh, and this is, this is a heavyweight hash function. It is very secure. Uh, but it is quite costly, in particular because it is uh, not hardware accelerated yet. So at the moment, on a regular processor, the hashing is going to take you 80% of the time. Uh, it might, so those numbers will severely go down once we have ac hardware acceleration for, for SHA-3. Um, one last thing I would like to mention about uh, public key encryption is uh, Beyond the performances, there is a migration challenge. It has been discussed uh, very quickly in the, in the uh, prior uh, session, which is you might have got used with something blessed, which is called Diffie-Hellman, and it is non-interactive. It is magical that, that this works. And we don't, apart from seaside, we don't know how to do this in a post-quantum way. And in particular, with lattices, you're going to need one of the party to speak first. You're going to need to know in advance who speaks first. Whereas with Diffie-Hellman, anyone can speak at any time, they can receive the message asynchronously, and then they derive a common secret key. And that's something that maybe you abuse in your protocols. 
I don't think it is actually abused in TLS, so I think uh, in, in some many scenarios it's not going to be a problem, but it might it might be uh, it might be in very specific in cases. And then I think the rest is mostly a matter of, of performances. Um, okay, so that's it for uh, public key encryption. Now let's move to the more difficult topic of digital signatures. So lattices are nice because among the post-quantum candidates, there's the only one offering you both encryptions and signatures. But it's not so easy to do signatures with lattices. You might think that it is easy, right? You could just take the good old recipe of RSA and the hashed and signed signatures, right? We have a, we have a function, we have kind of a trapdoor with this good basis. And if you, if you look at RSA signatures, at, at least at a very uh, high level uh, de detail, one way to do signatures is to actually use a decryption procedure to the hash of the message and define this as your signature. Right, there's kind of a duality between encryption and signatures for RSA. And uh, then uh, it was not supposed to be encryption, that was supposed to be verification. But to verify a signature, then you do it the other way around. You use the encryption procedure on the signature and you check that it equals the hash of the message. So can we just do the same with lattices? And in principle, it might look like it is the case, right? We have this tiling procedure, so what we could do is we hash the message as some random point in space, not in the lattice, so this message M, and then we use a tiling procedure to find a closed lattice point. You know, because this tile is nice and square, we have the guarantee that the lattice point, the signature, is going to be close to it. And then we verify by checking that we get a point that is in the lattice and close to the original message or the hash of the message. And if you're trying to use a bad basis for this, well, because this basis is going to be very long and thin, it is likely that your signature is actually going to be quite further apart. And, okay, it might have a chance to be closed, but in large dimensions, that's not going to happen. In dimension two, it's always a bit frustrating that we don't see that there's actually a huge gap between good and bad bases. Um, the thing is, that signature scheme is only secure if you don't use it. That is... <laughs> If I, give you, if I give you the public key, it's going to be hard to recover the secret key. But if I keep signing message and message and message, then something is going to leak. So it's, maybe you can use it a few times, but at some point it's going to be, it's going to, the, public, the secret key is going to become obvious to a smart adversary. Why is that? Well, it's because if you take the difference between the signature and the message, by design of the scheme, you know that those, this difference always fall in this tile, right? So now you get a lot of points in this tile. Can you recover the tile itself? Well, again, in two dimension, it, it, it looks kind of obvious, right? I, I'm going to take my ruler and, and take the best uh, approximation of it by, by taking my ruler until I catch all the points on the right side. Maybe I recover the parallel pipe and then I do a, a, a few computations and recover the basis. Is it obvious that it works in high dimension? No, but it is the case. It has been proven, uh, sorry, it has been proven by Nguyen and Regev <coughs> in 2006 that you can actually recover such parallel pipettes from random uniform points in them uh, in polynomial time. And in practice, it is, it is actually quite efficient. A few thousand signatures can suffice to recover uh, the secret key here. So, well, we could use it for 100 signatures and change the keys, but that's, that's uh, it's not very convenient. So, uh, what people did instead is, well, we have a leak, let's uh, seal it. And the, the problem is this very brutal uh, transition from being in the tile to being outside the tile. And that, that means that your distribution is, is very sharp. It's, it's uniform on the point and then suddenly it drops and there's nothing left. So the intuition is that we want to smooth out a little bit this parallel pipette. And uh, instead of now, what we're going to do is to devise an algorithm that does not always choose the closest parallel pipette or always the closest tile, but might choose one of the closed tile 
behind, uh, n near the point M. So here I'm representing by the darkness, you know, the density probability of choosing each of styles. And now if I move my message little by little, the transition from one tile to the next is much smoother. In some sense, it's going to hide much better the border of this parallel pipet. So again, here I'm giving you intuition, but this reasoning is not heuristic. It is actually a mathematical provable statement that this procedure, if you do it well and you use the proper discrete Gaussians and do all the things just right, then there is no correlation between this distribution and the secret key, which might be a bit surprising why we're using the secret key, but we can still make a distribution that is unrelated to it. Um, yeah, so, so that's it. That's the principle. So now let's look at the implementation details. So for the signatures, uh, for, for uh, sorry, for verification, it's all linear algebra mod Q as it was for encryption. Uh, however, now you, uh, you don't have those simplification that you had for encryption about, uh, you know, finding the, the, the styling that you could simplify. You can no longer simplify it. On the contrary, you have to complexify it. So now the linear algebra that you need to do is over the real numbers. And that sucks. Hard. Uh, and on top of that, once you've computed all your linear algebra and floating point arithmetic, then you have this crazy Gaussian distribution that the center varies on the fly, so you cannot pre-compute anything. You have to compute at high precision transcendental functions on real numbers. That's a nightmare. I mean, we do that every day. You know, if you use Sage and everything, you do that every day. But doing this in a Crypto a cryptographic context is wow. It's never been done. We've never done crypto using floating point arithmetic before lattices. <laughs> now we have to do it. So when, when you do this, you have to worry about numerical precision because if you're not sufficiently numerically precise, then you might actually leak again some information that you're trying to prevent. Um, there is another non-trivial issue, it's determinism. So now let's say, well, my signing server is, cannot handle the load. So I'm going to duplicate and have several servers sign instead. Then I compile the code on each server. Turns out the GCC version is not the same on each server. And one decide, well, you know, addition is kind of commutative. It's not exactly commutative for, um, associative, sorry, for, for floating point uh, arithmetic. But as an optimization, compilers assume that it is. And when compiler decide to swap the operations, the other decide not to. And because, and then and the result diverge. So if an adversary managed to get a signature for the same message on one server and then on the other, he gets two different signatures for the same message. And that completely destroys the security, instantly. Instantly, the adversary is given a short vector of the lattice. So, uh, this this is if if you if the signer sold the message himself before signing, this is less worrisome. But this is something you have to consider. Uh, then, yeah, time channel always uh, bites you. A lot of uh, floating point arithmetic operation are not so uh, time independent. Um, okay, but still, uh, some people were crazy enough uh, to implement it, and they've done quite a good job. Uh, it's 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 quite fast the signature and the verification, and the generation is a bit slower because of some uh, entry structure. But I think uh, it is uh, it gives a very performant signature scheme. And if you can if you can afford it, if you have a regular CPU, I think it is all fine. If you want to implement this on low-end hardware, you might struggle. Um, so, but we have alternatives. Um, so you have the deletion theme, which is based on a different paradigm. So it's not hashed and signed. It's some other uh, cryptographer trick called Fiatchamir with the boards. Um, so you get rid of all the floating point craziness. 
but then the, in the algorithm there is a, an annoying restart. So especially for uh, real-time application, it's a bit annoying because even if the scheme takes an average time of a, a few milliseconds, maybe once in a thousand time it's going to take ten times the average time. So can your application afford that is a question. Um, and signatures are significantly bigger, you know, factor three or four, uh, so are as uh, public keys. So now I'm, I'm uh, shamelessly plugging my latest work in there. Uh, Hook, um, we've submitted to the NIST. Quite honestly, I don't think it's, they're going to standardize it, but may maybe Moody has something to say about it. It's, it's just too similar to Falcon. They want something that is not uh, lattice-based. But we submitted it anyway so that people can uh, try to break it. Um, so it's the same hash and sign paradigm that Falcon. What we do is that we add an extra add an extra structure to the lattice. So on top of the circular structure, we, we add some more structure. Uh, and if you do this, you can get away with no floating point arithmetic at all, no crazy on the fly distribution at all. And uh, everything is nice. Except that, you know, it's, it's an assumption that is one year old and uh, it still needs to, to prove itself. Um, so since I'm discussing uh, breaking things, uh, let's also discuss the touchy topic of the current state of cryptanalysis. There's an insane amount of noise um, generated by a very limited amount of people. Uh, so uh, I, I, I just want to give you my, my, my take on this. Um, so my take on this is that the state of the art is kind of converging. We would like it to have converged, that's for sure. This, the thing is, it is still converging. Uh, that's where the research is at. In terms of asymptotic, the best algorithm has stabilized in 2015 to those quantities. And since then, people are mostly discussing what's hidden in these small o's. And it turns out that, well, it is substantial what's hidden in those, exp uh, in those expressions. Uh, and there's still further improvement. So, for example, we, a few years later, I invented a, a dimension for free trick where you could have a sublinear. You could implicitly decrease n by a, a sublinear amount. And in practice, it made quite a difference. It's actually this trick that allowed this saving algorithm to beat other worse algorithm in practice. So it's on this point on that we started to take saving seriously, not only theoretically, but uh, also in practice. Um, and people are having fun, including myself, uh, implementing those best algorithm and uh, trying to break records. So current dimension for which we can solve record is about 180. And for this, we used uh, GPUs, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, um, we used an insane amount of RAM. One, we had a machine with 1.5 terabyte of RAM. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> it gives me the chills. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, but. Uh, yeah, we need to reach more than 400 dimension before we can claim uh, a break. And it's an exponential algorithm, right? We're not halfway. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, so it's indicative what we do on, uh, in practice, but it is not how you want to establish the security level of, of a scheme. And that's where things get messy because those algorithms are crazy. There's like, several layers and then implement and implementation tricks and algorithmic tricks at all level and modeling them precisely is 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 a nightmare i've been doing that for the last 10 years and uh, so so sometimes you know it's too much to handle so we simplify a few things usually we simplify and uh, under cost things instead of uh, over costing them and um, the funny thing is that you would think that cryptanalysis always gets better. But because of this, because we're simplifying things first and then maybe digging back and undoing the simplification, sometimes it's not right. Sometimes the numbers goes up. And, but no, not everyone follows the fact that they go up. There's, there's kind of a publication bias, right? So if you're, if you're a cryptanalyst, you, you want a paper to get accepted. So you want the numbers to be low. 
And then you have several models. Some are more precise, some are less precise, some are better, some are lower. And you can selectively choose the ones that you want to make your numbers look the smallest. So for example, I have this paper at PQ Crypto where we show that some algorithmic part, some probabilistic analysis that has been idealized before was under-costing things. And you know, we, we actually try to fix this and show that, well, if you don't spend more memory, you're going to pay you know, five more bits on times, and then you can trade that back for even more crazy amount of memory um, to only three bits. Okay. All the analysis that are published today completely ignore this paper. So, um, yeah, if you, if you read the claims that are being made, uh, some say that Kyber 512 is bleeding age. And it might even be weaker than AES-128. Um, so this claim, they ignore some of the documented overheads. Then they ignore other stuff that are unfortunately undocumented and remain to be documented. Is it feasible to gather so much memory? Let's, let's go back to this picture a little bit. So if you have one petabyte by square meters, even the idealized attack requires the surface of the moon. And uh, yeah, if you want to if you want to gain a, a factor eight sometime, then you can uh, go to Jupiter. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I don't I don't want to dismiss the the actual metrics of counting gates, etc. But security is not just a number, right? It's an assessment of feasibility. So, is it feasible to gather so much memory? Um, and then when you have so much memory, even forgetting the speed of light delays, which is something terribly hard to analyze carefully in a complicated algorithm like this, you also have the logistic of routing RAM that has been ignored. It's like it is assumed that when I want to send something to a bucket, it is assumed that the thing just teleports to the right place and there is no, there's, there's no, no work to even send it there. I mean, in practice, you have a network and you know, in, you have routers, and in routers, what do you have? Gates. <laughs> Those gates have not been accounted for. Um, and, yeah, it's still to be done, but the numbers are going to also go up. They might go down a little bit. So, yeah, there are no's, and there are room for improvement in the algorithms. I think given the current state of things, it is, it, is, it is a worthy goal to do the fine-tuning and save a few more bits. That's, that's our job. I'm not saying it is not. But I'm saying if you're worried about whether you should use Kyber 5 till or not, this is not the main issue. The main issue is, are we going to get new ideas that make serious inroads, not about the fine-tuning? Let's still do the fine-tuning. Huh? It's important. We want to we wanna get down to, to the bottom of this question. But that's not the concern. And that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Um, that was a very interesting presentation, and also interesting to uh, stay, uh, to see, uh, to hear your uh, take on the debate around uh, the state of the art crypto analysis. But I can imagine there are some questions in the audience. Please feel free to come forward. To prove I don't understand, <laughs> to show that. I don't even know what I'm asking. In a typical, in your po view, point, in a typical letter-based algorithm, how many dimensions are going to be used? Uh, in Kyber 512, despite the name 512, it is actually 1024. <laughs> okay. And th is there a relationship oh, between no, the actually key... Oh, no, 768. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Confusing is, with the is there a relationship between the key length that is mentioned and the dimensions? It is growing with the dimension. Okay. <laughs> but it's not the, the numbers that you see, Kyber 512, 512 doesn't give you the, the size of the keys. It okay. gives you 
the dimension of the secret, but then there is the dimension of the error to account for. It's a messy business. <laughs> okay, okay. I wonder what, how that evolves. Thank you. Hi, Leo. Thanks for the presentation. If you could clear out an existential doubt for me. Um, so I was interested in this process of sampling random lattices. As far as I understand, we're in, in Kyber, we sample one random lattice per key, this famous A matrix. And I was wondering, um, in this process of sampling uh, these random matrices, which is entry-wise, uh, how do we know that the, the lattices are actually good, or is there a way to maybe relate two keys, uh, or, or that they belong to a certain set of lattices that, as you mentioned, they can be you know, circulant or, or things like that? So that's uh, actually an interesting question, and it is one of the reason that uh, the theorists were very excited uh, by lattices, which is, well, in the case of RSA, like there's like all those weak keys that you need to carefully avoid. You need to catalog them and you need to avoid them. And they happen with non-negligible probability. Lattices have those worst case to average case connection. And fundamentally, it means that a random lattice is with overwhelming probability as hard as the worst of all the lattices. So in some sense, there is, at least in principle, no reason to be concerned about sampling a bad lattice that would be weaker than, than the other ones. Even if, even if the, um, the short basis is not known in this case? I'm not sure to understand. Uh, in the case of Kyber, as far as I understand, uh, the, the short basis of the lattice is, is not really known. We're using it is. Problem, uh, right? um, I mean, the thing is that you, you, you have your LB sampled and then there's many lattices that you can construct around it. And there is, and that's why the, the, the one who knows the secret key can decrypt. He knows something special about the lattice. Not a full short basis, but actually a, a set of short vectors. And that's, oh. then that's enough. So from the one who generates the lattice, there is some secret information that is known about the lattice, something special that is known about the lattice. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Leo. There was one uh, question from our uh, audience online. Uh, so uh, what are the open problems in lattice-based cryptography and uh, where should we start uh, when we want to work on those? <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Hoke, I, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm nah, I, I, it's my own. Uh, excitement. This is, I mean, uh, there's been fantastic development over 15 years on lattice-based cryptography based around this formalism of uh, learning with error and a short integer solution that has cleaned, because lattice-based cryptography is older, but it was very messy. It was very dirty and hand wavy. Uh, they, they cleaned it up, uh, the theorists, with, with this formalism, and, and it's, it's, it's quite nice. But we've been doing that for 15 years. And uh, now there's a, the lattice isomorphism problem, which is uh, what uh, Hawke is based on. You represent lattices by quadratic form instead of by basis. It's, it's a different way of approaching lattice-based cryptography here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I hope this speaks on, uh, but uh, yeah. So a concrete starting point, uh, point would be to start uh, trying to break Hawk. Try to break out or implement it better or uh, replace, the, because here we use the orthogonal lattice. There's one crazy idea with the lattice isomorphism problem is to start using the very, very fancy lattices that the mathematicians and coding theorists have been developing for decades or hundreds of years. There are lattices that are very beautiful and symmetrical and well packed. And that because they're better packing than random lattices, then you could even improve further the decoding capability. Instead of doing rectangular cells, you could do cells that are much nicer shape. And then from that, you could uh, improve the parameters uh, significantly. But that, that's, the framework is there. Finding the right lattice and finding the right uh, everything remains to be done. OK, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Leo again.
In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.